good morning, Ignite Church. Oh, man, that was a little surprising for us. I'm going to do that one more time. Sorry, I don't normally do this anymore, guys, but I'm going to make you do it again. Good morning, Ignite Church. Okay, that was a little better. Like one person yelled, okay? It's good. it's good to see you guys. Happy New Year to any of you that we haven't said it to yet. We are so glad that you're here with us. If you don't know who I am, uh, Pastor Jason Lomberger. So glad you're here. If you're watching online, glad you're here as well. Before you get too comfortable in your seat, stand up, greet your neighbor, give him a fist bump, high five, handshake, hug. Most of you Igniters know the deal. If you're new to Ignite, we do this every single week. Josh, I got you, bro. Come here, man. Good morning, bro. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ron. What's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> Just a, a, a little brief moment of touch. And again, I, I, I know that for some of you that's easy and for others of you, you don't love it, but you are sitting beside eternal neighbors, and every once in a while, it's good for us just to be reminded um, of that reality. We're in week two of Something's Gotta Change, and if you weren't with us last week, that's okay. It was the was first day of the year. Hope that you guys had an incredible new year, um, but we started off with a, a series I'm really, really passionate about, really excited about. Um, it is unapologetically um, a, a new year series, and so if you were coming in hoping not to hear one of those, I'm really sorry to disappoint you. Um, there is something about this time of year, as Pastor Chris said that does just, I think it speaks to hope. As people, as men and women made in the image of God, um, I do think moments like the beginning of a year, it's a place where we can look for with hope, believing, hey, despite whatever was in last year, this year can be better. I can be better. I can be different. I can change. I can grow. Um, and, and that thought, I do believe, really, is a spirit-inspired um, God-inspired belief. And so um, I, if you're not doing New Year's resolutions, that's completely okay because that's not what we're talking about. Um, the only problem with New Year's resolutions, and guys, those of you that are doing them, do them. Like eat what you're supposed to eat, lift how you're supposed to lift, you know, pursue those career goals, take the, you know, those finance classes and make sure your money's doing the right thing. Like all that stuff is good. But all those things really are out there kind of things. Like what we eat and how we lift and how we manage money, those are out there kind of things. If we focus on out there and never change in here, we're ultimately going to fail. And so what we're doing for the next couple of weeks is really looking at what does the Bible have to say about us changing the most important thing, our heart and our mind. Because if we have a changed heart, if we have a changed mind, um, everything can change. And so I'm really, really passionate about this. Um, I mentioned it last week, but I'm a, a psych major. And so people's minds and people's hearts and people's motivations are something that's always been very fascinating to me. So with no further ado, if you haven't already, pull out uh, the app. Um, the outline is going to be right there. If you don't have Ignite Church's app, you know, a little commercial break, we'd love for you to have it. Um, we, we want you to be connected to everything that we're doing. January is a busy, busy month in a lot of really good ways. Again, unapologetically, we want every single one of you, if you're not a partner of our church, to consider joining with us to reach this city to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. If those of you who've taken that first step, uh, we want you to take the next step because partnership isn't an ending of anything. It's the beginning of our equip process. We want you to be discipled, and we have taken a lot of time, a lot of energy. We have a lot of people that are committed to walking with you in discipleship. And so in a couple weeks, uh, step two of equip is happening, and um, it's all about Christian disciplines. And so you can start the year off with people like fasting with you and learning uh, how to do uh, the quiet time with you. And, and so we're really, really serious as a church about wanting to walk with you and give you uh, the, the next step so you can grow in your journey with Jesus. Um, but go into the outline if you want to. Uh, we're going to look at a proverb of Jesus. It's one of his shortest ones, um, but it's so rich in meaning. And so uh, just read along with me. Matthew 13, starting with verse 45. It says, again, and by the way, whenever Jesus says again, um, it lets you know that there's something before that. And so I'll encourage you, read the whole thing. It's, it's powerful. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, interesting, seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found a pearl of great price, he went and he sold everything he had and he bought it. So what we have here is this really, really interesting story Jesus is telling. And some of you who are kind of, you know, you know a little bit about the parables, uh, this parable probably reminds you of another parable. Jesus tells another parable um, that's very similar to this, where a man was walking through a field, he finds treasure in that field, and then he sells everything that he has and buys the field so that he can have the treasure in the field. Well, this is very similar to that, but a little different. Um, and so for a second, all of us are going to be businessmen, businesswomen. We're going to be merchants. Um, and if you're a merchant, um, one of the categories or, or, or needs to be a really good one is you know what's valuable and you know what's not. You know what's trash and you know what's treasure. 
And, you know, y'all know I'm from Beargrass, and so how we, how we kind of, how I think of this in Beargrass terms, I don't know if any of you have, have seen any of the shows uh, uh, about, you know, those kind of like storage units where, you know, guys go in and they, they like buy a storage unit without even seeing what's inside of it. So they might buy a storage unit for 85 bucks, and it's like whatever treasure's in here or whatever garbage is in here, it now belongs to you. See, like that, that um, Pastor Jason's all about that life right there. Like that's really fascinating to me because you get a lot of garbage in those things, but every once in a while, like, yeah, somebody will buy this. It looks like nothing, and they find some precious pearl inside it. So they know what's valuable and know what's not valuable. And in this story, we have a merchant, and he sees this pearl that is like the most perfect thing he's ever seen or she's ever seen because my sister is this, and, you know, it could be any of us. And what the Scripture says, I want you to look at it again. It says he's, he's seeking beautiful pearls, and he finds one of great price, and he went and he sold how much, Ignite Church? What does it say he did? He sold what? All. He sold all that he had to buy it. When he saw this thing, he, he accurately weighed the value of this treasure. And for those of you who aren't pearl people, I don't care what gem you want. Let's just put it any gem you want it to be. Just everything, that all of my ships and all of my merchandise, all of my caravans, all of my employees, everything, my house, everything that I have, doesn't measure up to this. And so he sells everything he has to have this thing. And some of you are like, well, what's the point, Jason? Is this going to be a money sermon? No, nothing to do with money. This message has to do, and this story has to do with understanding the value of Jesus, the value of spirituality. And I know on a Sunday morning, most of you in this house, most of you watching online, you would agree that, like, Jesus is the most valuable thing. That our spiritual walk is the most valuable thing. Like, I don't, I'm not going to make you raise your hand for that. I'm not going to make you say amen to that. Like, we, 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 you're here because there's a tacit agreement to that. But can we admit that we live in a culture that is trying to, like, drag our attention and our time, our energy, and our priorities in every other direction other than spirituality? Like, we live in a culture that either actively or passively, and I, I don't know which one it is for you, it's constantly trying to convince you that if you just had this or you just went here or you just was in this relationship or you just had this job or I don't know what your thing is, if you just had blank, then life would be so great. And we have the scriptures remind us of the truth. You can have everything this broken world has to offer and you can still be so, so empty, y'all. And you can have nothing and be so full if you have Jesus. Oh, my, my sons are so addicted to, to Minecraft right now. I don't even know if I've, I've mentioned that. I talk about them a lot. And, and, right, and they, 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 they go through phases. If you were here with us at Halloween, we were, we were the Sonic family because they, at the time they were in the Sonic. Well, they've kind of transitioned now. It's like they still like Sonic, but Minecraft, Minecraft and Creepers. If you don't know anything about this, you are blessed and highly favored, y'all. Because right, my world is surrounded by this. You know, all these, it's, it's funny that the, the weird words you learn as a, as a dad or a mom that you never thought, you know. But my kids are consumed with this video game and with all the merchandising of this video game. And they, they absolutely love being in this block world. If you don't know anything about Minecraft, it's a world made of blocks. And I'm old enough to look at it and say, that is absolutely dumb. Anybody want to say amen? I just, I, it just seems like I'm old enough to say that with my kid. Like, it is everything to be able to build these worlds out of blocks. And uh, a couple of years ago, actually, I talked about the guy um, who created that game. His, his name is Marcus Pearson. Um, and he created that game early 2000s, and he sold it to Microsoft in 2015 for $2.5 billion. So if you think the blocks are stupid, apparently Microsoft does not agree because they bought it for a whole lot of money. And for those of you who are like that, because I remember, I remember when that happened thinking, that is the dumbest deal Microsoft has ever made because it's just this, this game about blocks. Well, they've made about $4.5 billion, so it wasn't that dumb. Uh, they, 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 they saw the value of that pearl that I, that I couldn't see, but a couple of years ago, this guy, he's young, um, and he's really young. He's in his 30s. Um, created this game for fun and then sells it for 2.5 billion. With a B, he becomes a billionaire. And he wrote on, uh, on Twitter a couple years ago. Uh, he probably had a little too much of something, so he was really honest in ways maybe he shouldn't have been. But he talked about the reality that he had 15 houses all over the world, friends everywhere he goes. Anytime he wants a girl, he gets one. Anytime, like he has everything we think we want, we want and he was talking about how empty his life was. Just how empty it was. Because he never knew if his friends were really his friends. He never knew if his girlfriend really loved him. He never knew if anybody really valued him. Because when you have everything, everybody wants what you have. Right? 
And, and, and it was just such a perfect example. He created this thing for fun, and then all of a sudden his life became this empty place, surrounded with people and totally alone, surrounded with money and absolutely impoverished, surrounded with love and absolutely starving for it. And so as we set our priorities, let's recognize what the pearl of great price really is. Right off the bat, if you have Jesus, if you really, and some of you, you think you have him, but you don't. You think you have him, but you don't. You window shop for Jesus. And then you, you see it through the window. You say, oh, that looks really nice. That's what we're doing here. You're looking through the window, and then you're going to walk away to some other store. If you really have him, you have everything. So what we're going to be talking about is how we can change our mind to understand that truth. Because I can say that, and we can say amen to that. And I'm, I'm admitting, I'm right with you. Like, this isn't a, 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 a me and you. It's an us. A part of being human is we have moments where we see the truth. Our priorities align correctly. And then if we're not very, very careful, it's so human of us to shift based on things that are out there in the world. And so today, we're going to try to be focused on the right things. So if you hadn't opened your app by now, too late, we're jumping in. I wanted to give you a word there that kind of is the basis of everything we're talking about today. It's a Greek word for seek, and that word is zeteo. Um, and if you're taking notes, uh, what zeteo means is to crave or to aim at. So like it's going to be an archery term. Um, to seek or to strive for. So like the question that I would want you to ask yourself, and you write this down, people in the app, if you're taking pen and paper, write down, the question I want you to kind of consider today is, what am I really seeking? What am I really seeking? Again, a, a moment like this, you, you've come on a Sunday morning to be encouraged, to be inspired, to connect with others in the community of faith, but I also hope you've come to be challenged a little bit so that you can be a little more when you leave than when you arrived. And one of the questions that helps me focus on, my, on, on, on what's important and what's not is what am I really seeking in this day? What am I really seeking in this moment? What am I really seeking? And I wish I could tell you as your pastor that I'm always seeking Jesus, but that's just a lie and my wife is here and she'd say amen, but she don't want to embarrass me. Like I'm not always seeking the right things. Sometimes I'm seeking my pride. Sometimes I'm seeking affirmation. Sometimes I'm seeking my pleasure. Sometimes I'm seeking my way. Sometimes, like, there's a lot of things that I seek at times that are contrary to the pearl of great price. But when my life and when your life is aligned in seeking the right thing, man, that's a good year. That's a good day. That's a good moment. And so we're gonna learn how we can grab that together. So let's jump in uh, to this. I want you to write this down. We talked about this last week, but it's kind of a, a statement we'll keep coming back to over and over and again. It's just the truth. Write this down. Our lives are always moving. They are. And it's just, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Often the Bible says, it talks about this as the heart, but we know it's the mind. Like wherever our mind leads us, that's where we tend to put our feet. That's where we tend to put our hands. That's where we tend to put our time. That's where we tend to put our money. Um, we all go through life, and some of you are going to like this and some of you are not, but it's just the truth, so I'm going to tell it to you. We all go through life with a certain level of what psychologically you call cognitive bias. It's just, just bias. Now, now, in our politically correct world, bias is a dirty word. We typically see it used very negative. But honestly, when you look at the true definition of bias, bias is not a negative word. It just means that it's a belief system that sometimes is true and sometimes it's not, but it's a belief system that affects our behavior. That's what a bias is. And all of you in this house, you have biases. Some of you are like, no, I don't, Pastor Jason. Well, if you, if you have a political party that you, have, that you align with, you have a bias. You just do. And if you're anything like the average Americans uh, in, in our country, if you do have a political party you align with, last time you voted, whenever that was, and that's not my business to know when that was, but last time you voted, you just went straight ticket with whatever party you aligned with. That's just the truth, right? We are biased towards this group that we believe in. Many of you, you enjoy sports. And so... Listen, when somebody comes in wearing the wrong color, you're a little bit biased. Can we say amen to that? You know, like, right, you have a team that is, they're the best. They're the best. Well, they might not really be the best. My team at Carolina, they believed they were the best. And can we all just say amen to the fact they're probably not the best this year? Amen. Like, they're just, they, they brought it, they were number one at the beginning of the season. They're not going to be number one probably at the end of the season. Like, yeah, but yeah, I can be true blue Carolina, but like, that, that, just because I think they're the best doesn't mean they're the best. We have biases, and, and, and you know, it, it goes in every part of our life. So just for fun, just for fun, 
Let's do one that's easy, it's non-threatening, you know, we're in the house of God, let's not make enemies, let's make friends. Like, let's talk about food for a little bit. We're all, we all have types of food we like. How many of you here this morning, I really want you to answer me this, raise a hand to this. How many of you, uh, good old-fashioned America, steak and potatoes, hamburgers and hot dogs, that American food is the best food, how many of you would agree to that? Okay, a couple of you, amen, you like that kind of, okay. How many of you are more Italian, more Italian mozzarella and Parmesan and, yeah, okay, a marinara sauce, Alfredo, yeah, okay, okay. How many of you, it's more Mexican, it's like your thing, spicy and savory and, okay, Mexican, okay. How many of you more, say, more, more like, more Asian, so like Chinese food or Japanese food or Vietnamese food, okay, okay, some of you guys, um, some of you are raising your hand for everyone and you just like to eat, okay, <laughs> whatever, it's fine, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're like ruining my illustration, but whatever. That's <laughs> all no, <sorry>. no. right. <laughs> um, yeah, we tend to have a bias of the things that we like. And some of you, you really do like all those and, and, and more. And that's okay, too. Uh, for me personally, if I had to pick, if I had to pick one, I, Italian all the way. I'm not Italian. I have not a speck of Italian blood in me. But I can eat Italian food um, every single day. And, man, yeah, it's so good. Um, we all have things that we, and that's fine for food. It's even fine for political parties. It's fine for sports. But when we have bias about us, about others, and about God, that's not fine. You see, some of you, you carry around a bias about how other people feel about you that probably isn't true. You carry, you carry around a bias about how God feels about you that might not be true. You carry around a bias about how the church is, and it might not be true. Some people carry around bias about how pastors are, and it might be true. It might not be true. It, but, and those things, they affect us in a way that we have to challenge. And so what I wanted us to do is I want us to look at some of the words of Paul that are so powerful. Again, if you were here with us last week, um, I really encourage you to dive into Paul. He writes about the power of the mind so frequently in his letter to the church of Philippi and Philippians. He does it a lot in, to, to his letters to the church of Corinth as well. Um, and, and because where our mind goes, that's where we tend to go. So let's look at what he has to say a little bit about our mind. Philippians 4, 8, again, this whole chapter is filled with gold on how to have a mind that is aligned rightly with God. So this is just one verse out of many that are in that chapter. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Um, to put it in Beargrass terms, because that's where I'm from. <laughs> to put it in Beargrass terms, Paul is saying to us, that we need to think about what we think about. Think about what we think about. Because if we live in a culture that, again, wants to guide and lead and direct our thoughts and our opinions and our perceptions of the world, of ourselves, of our neighbors, and of God. Our world has an opinion about you. But we need to decide. We need to decide what is true. And we need to go to God's word to see what he says is true is good, is lovely, is right, is praiseworthy. Um, literally yesterday I was riding um, with my wife. Uh, we were coming back from a baby shower that was here at the church, and uh, she dropped a fact on me that as somebody who's not a part of social media very much, if you don't know this about me, um, I, I have a social media page. I unashamedly admit people help me because I am really, I'm bad, y'all. I'm bad at social media. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, and, and as much as I love all of you, I just don't care what you had for lunch yesterday. I just don't care. And, so, you know, it's just it's not my thing. It's not my thing. It's not my, I'm a huge reader. And so I'm on my phone all the time, but I'm usually reading other things. Um, my wife is more in line with a lot of Americans that she, she cares about people and is looking in social media to see what people are up to and, and doing. And she dropped this bomb on me yesterday. She said, Jason, she said, the average American sees between two to 4,000 advertisements every single day. And at first, I was like, no, that's just a lie. That's not true. Because me and my old self was like, there's just not enough minutes in the day to do like commercials, that many com for a person to see that many commercials. I was, like, I was like, if each commercial takes, you know, five seconds, and after you've seen two or 300 commercials, your day is gone. And she's like, no, no, no. It's not about like commercials. It's when you're scrolling. It's like, yeah, you see what your friend had for lunch, and then all of a sudden there's an ad. You see your friend's, you know, beautiful baby shot, and then there's another ad. You see these two, you know, connecting points. She's like, when you're scrolling, for whatever medium you might scroll through, if you do scroll through, she's like, it's just, they're bo like, we're bombarded with this message that there's something out there that we don't have that we need. And like when she said that, I was like, man, like we're, that, that's unique. In our, like again, when I grew up, you know where commercials lived? Television. That's where they lived. And you had to cut on that box 
and choose to sit down and put yourself there. Commercials are with you all the time now. I never thought about it that way. Like, like that, that pull that there's something you're missing that somebody else has. It's inescapable now. So how do you decide what is real and what is not? How do you decide what the priorities should be and shouldn't be? What Paul is saying is that we choose to take control of our mind and direct it towards the things that God says is true. Someone say amen to that. That's what we have to do. And so what we're going to talk about a little bit is how we live that kind of a life. I, I talk a lot about spiritual warfare if you're new to Ignite. I talk a lot about it. I, 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 don't, I know that some of you, again, you know, that you're not as military thinking as I am, and that's okay. Um, and I'm not a military guy all myself, except for in the spiritual. But I do want you to write this down, because I, I think it's true, and I think for some of you it will help you. Um, so write this down. You can't defeat what you can't define. You can't defeat an enemy that you can't define. There's just, that's just, I mean, again, it's like, you, you can't. Like, if you, don't, if you don't know what is interfering with your relationship with God, you just can't beat that thing. If you don't know what is pushing you back from your spouse, you just can't beat that thing. If you don't know what's causing a gap between you and your kids or you and your coworkers or you and your friends or you and your neighbors, you just can't beat. You can't defeat what you can't define. So it's real important. That's what we really talked about a lot last week was how to define the things that want to push us back. Today, I want us to go past that. And I want to talk a little bit about, well, if I'm not supposed to be in this place, what does it look like to be in the place that God has for me? And so let's jump right into it. Um, so a couple of things. We will direct our thoughts towards, number one, guys, you can write this down, things we should be thinking about, repentance. We're going to be a people that we walk the path, we seek after, we, we discipline and direct our minds to have a heart and a mind of repentance. Again, some of you, repentance is very easy and natural. Some of you, repentance is very, very difficult. I want to define it through Christ's words. And so um, if you look with me at 1 John 1, 6 through 9, he talks about what he believes um, the heart of Jesus is in regard to this. And so these are his words. It says, if we say we have fellowship with Jesus, that's the capital him, and we walk in darkness. If, so again, just think about this. If we say that we're walking with Jesus, but in reality, we're living in darkness which is something that all of us as believers struggle with sometimes. It isn't that we haven't been justified, it's just that we're in a place where maybe our eyes and our heart and our mind aren't centered where they need to be. So if we do that, we lie. and We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's important to note, by the way. In other words, this journey is a shared journey, and we connect with others who are doing it. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful, and he is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what is, what is the Apostle John saying here? What is Christ? What is the Holy Spirit saying here? I'll tell you what I believe he's saying. He is saying that one of those thoughts that we need to constantly have, using again Paul saying that we're going to direct our thoughts, we constantly need to be thinking about a heart, having a heart of humility, brokenness, and repentance. And, and, and again, some of you, man, that is natural and that is easy. You understand where you're at. You're, it's easy for you to have remorse about the struggles in your life. It's easy for you to say you're sorry. As a matter of fact, I'll call you out. Some of you, you are still saying sorry for something that Jesus already forgiven, and you need to stop saying sorry, and, and someone should say amen to that. So, sometimes the enemy wants us to feel like we're still condemned for something that Christ already forgave us for, and that's not good. But there are some of you in this house, and there are some of you watching online, that you really feel like you're a good person. You really feel like you're a good person, and you feel like you're doing things fine, and you feel like life is okay. And look, I get that. I don't want to push back too hard on you on that, but I do believe this. Hell's going to be full of good people. It's going to be full of good people who thought they were doing fine. Heaven is going to be full of broken people who realize they were never fine, and even when Jesus forgave them, they still need to keep going to him to be fine. That's like heaven is going to be full of broken people who are constantly aware of their need for a Savior. That's, that's what, some of you are like, well, Jason, where does the Bible say that? I'm glad you asked that. Go to Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 3, the very first thing Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the spiritually impoverished. The poor in spirit, most of your translations say, but 
Blessed are those who realize how spiritually impoverished they are. They are the ones who will be in heaven. They are the children of heaven. So Jesus says it as plain as day. The people who are going to be in heaven with me are the ones who realize that God is perfect and they're not. And so it's not a weakness to not be perfect. It's a weakness to claim that you are perfect and you're not. That's what John's saying here. He's saying, guys, let me, let me put in a metaphor for you. Some of you, you are talking about how brightly your light's shining, but you're stumbling around in the darkness. You're a liar. You're a liar when you do that. And, and what I think he's really speaking into that, and this is just the truth in the physical as well as the spiritual, um, and all of you can resonate with this because we've all had these moments. And I'm, I'm middle-aged now, so these moments are happening to me a lot more where you just don't sleep quite as well and you are up a little bit more in, in the night. It's fascinating. When, when I get up and it's dark in my house, I can see in my house in the darkness. What happens when the light cuts on? I become a vampire, <laughs> you know, for half a second. Because I had adjusted, I had adjusted to living my life in the dark. And it, took, it takes a little while to reorient to having the light cut on. Some of you in this place probably, and I love you, that's why I'm saying this to you. You've been living your life in the dark long enough that you, can, you feel fine in the dark. You feel like you can see in the dark. And yeah, I'm begging you, cut on the light. And at first, there might be a little bit of pain involved in cutting on the light. That's what repentance is all about. It's, that, it's admitting that, that we're not, we haven't arrived yet. And it's painful to do that. But when you get through that transition and that pain, all of a sudden you open your eyes and you thought you could see in the dark. But man, come on. When you cut the lights on, everything looks different. And what's, what's true in the light is the, is the reality. Things look real in the dark that aren't real. And when you cut the light on, you can see what is real and what is true. Please write this down. Humility is the first step in the journey of holiness. Humility. It's the first step in the journey of holiness. So to make this really practical, my brothers and sisters, I'll speak to my brothers first. Guys, we're the spiritual leaders of our families. So if you're married, if you have kids, you're the spiritual leader. Like for you to be a leader that's able to go to your wife and say, I love you and I know I don't always get it right. Forgive me for when I get it wrong. And help tell me when I get it wrong. Help remind me how I can be more like Christ to you, to our kids, to our family, to our neighbors. Like, I, I want to live a humble life that is willing to let others speak into how I can be more like my Savior. To my sisters. Listen, I know, I know especially those of you who are moms, like, like the, the words of the day are because I said so. That's, you know, the, because I said so. Why? Because I said so. That is true for your kids, and that's true for your husbands. And if you're a smart husband, you can say, yes, ma'am, like I do, and because I said so. But for you to have a heart of humility to go to your spouse, to go to your kids and say, listen, your mom is not always right. And so help me. Help me to be more like my Savior. I'm, humbly, I'm humbled to admit that I, I'm not perfect all the time, that I sometimes I falter. Sometimes I falter. Be that person at your work. Be that person with your family. Be that person in your small group. And I promise you'll be a person of transformation. It starts with repentance. Number two, guys, you can write this down. It goes from repentance. If we, the thing we're going to be thinking about next is righteousness. Righteousness. There's this really um, beautiful uh, part, again, of the Sermon of the Mount that Jesus uh, shares. And most of you, if, you're, if you've been a believer for a little while, you know it. Where Jesus talks about worry. Again, in America, um, like crazy the amount of anxiety and worry that grips us as a people, both clinical and circumstantial. Like worry is a real part of our story in our life. Anxiety is a real part of many of our stories in many of our lives. And Jesus speaks so clearly on this. And so I, I want to read the scripture for you. And there's a part that I will admit to you I often overlook, but I think it's the most important part. So today I don't want us to overlook it. I want us to really learn from it and apply it. So this is Matthew 6, 25. Jesus says, therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life. Which sounds crazy. Can we say amen? It sounds crazy. Out of context, it sounds crazy. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink. Don't worry about your body, what you'll put on. Is not your life more than food? And isn't your body more than clothing? Like, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. But your heavenly Father feeds them. Here's a question for us to consider, by the way. Aren't you more valuable than they? Aren't you? Sometimes in my midst of my worry, because I am a, a little bit of a worrier, um, I do really believe the Holy Spirit will bring that question to me. Jason, do, do you think you're at least as valuable to me as a bird? Because birds are cheap, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're cheap. And they were cheap then, they're cheap now. And it's like, like, like yeah, if he can take care of them, he can take care of me. Sorry, that's just a personal thing. Um, why do you worry about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory, even he was not arrayed like one of these. Therefore, don't worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And I love this. Okay, for just a second, let's just stop for a second. Couldn't this have been written just for today? Because again, you're about to go out into a world that is trying to convince you with all it is that if you just eat this food, drink this drink, wear this clothes, have this car, buy this house, whatever, whatever that product, whatever your blank is, if you just had it, you'd have life. Right? And so, so it's amazing, the power of the Word of God, because it could be speaking, it could be written right to us. It is right for us. Don't worry about those things. And then we get to the point that I really want to emphasize, but... See, when you see that in the Bible, you need to, you need to t- take a second and take note. But, so Jesus said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But, so we can assume there is actually something we should worry about. Right? Like, what I'm about to say is an exception to all the don't worry rules. But, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Again, to, to try to simplify that, because I need things to be simplified for me, um, and hopefully it will be of value to you. What Jesus is saying there is that if you worry about being in God's will, you don't have to worry about anything else at all. If you worry about being in God's will, you don't have to worry about anything else at all. And it is amazing, because that's the one thing that often we don't worry about, right? We worry about all that stuff, and our minds are consumed with all that stuff. But the one thing we need to worry about is walking with our God every day and doing that rightly. Um, but maybe because I'm a man, um, most guys, we like to know how to win, right? <laughs> Which sometimes makes relationships hard because in relationships, there aren't rule books. There aren't usually checklists. Um, and that makes it hard. Jesus, my brothers, Jesus is giving us a clear pathway to win here. How do you win as a husband? You worry and focus on seeking Christ's kingdom and his righteousness with your family. And you win every time. You win. I'm not saying your kids are always going to love you. I'm not saying your wife's always going to appreciate you. I'm not saying you're never going to mess up. But if you live a life that is focused on seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, you're going to win as as a husband. You're going to win as a dad. Those of you who aren't in that season yet, even as you're going to win as a man. You're going to win, my sisters, as a woman. That's what we should be focused on and worried about in this life. If you worry about being in God's will, you don't have to worry about anything else at all. So we talked about repentance. We've talked about righteousness. And, and some of you, you need to be seeking those things this year. Like this is for you. And others of you are like, Jason, I'm a little bit more mature. I feel like I'm actually in a pretty good place in both those areas of my life. What, what is there for me? Well, this, this last one hopefully is for you. Right? You can write this down. The, the last thing that we're going to really focus this year on seeking and directing our thoughts towards is restoration. Restoration. Because for some of you, it's not about you. It's about you being used by Jesus for someone else. For some of you, I mean, God's always doing things in us and to us and through us. But for some of you, it's not about you. It's about God using you for someone else. Let me read this from 2 Corinthians. This is such a beautiful message. It says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, if you're not really paying attention to what I said, that's one of those, Paul, he wrote with such flair and he wrote with such a high way, it's easy to get lost. Now, here's what Paul's saying. He's saying Jesus came to reconcile the world to a perfect God by dying for them. Can we say amen to that? He said, that's what Jesus came to do. And then, don't miss it. He says, and he's given you and me that word to tell the world that. He put that, the message of that has been given to us. We're supposed to be the agents of that word of reconciliation. But he goes on and says, now then, that means we're ambassadors for Christ. And I want you to like take this and make it personal. It's as though God is pleading through you. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Do you know someone in your neighborhood, in your office, in your family, in your circle that needs to be reconciled to God? And everybody, not yes. If you don't, 
then I want to talk to you because you live under a rock somewhere, and I'd like to hear what it's like to, to do that. Like, we all have somebody in a circle that we're connected to that we just know is not walking closely to God. Well, maybe this year is the year that God wants you to be a part of their life being reconciled to the God who made them. And I know that's scary and intimidating. But even more so, like, again, I want, I want all of you, brothers, I want all of you to have the most physically fit body you've ever had in all your life. I want your bank accounts to be more full than they've ever been in their life. I want your relationships to be stronger than they've ever been in their life. I know there's kids in the room, but for you married couples, I hope that that part of your marriage, you know what I'm talking about, is better than it's ever been in your life. Everybody says amen. Okay, like, like, I hope all those goals you might set for a new year. I sound, you know, like, sometimes I say things and they make people wince, and I tried really hard not to that time. Okay, <laughs> I want you to be successful in all these New Year's resolutions. But could we be resolved this year to Jesus using our life to save one life? Just one. I know you can't save everybody in your office, but you can, you can impact one. You can't maybe not save everybody in your family, but you can impact one. Yeah, I, you probably can't reach all of your neighborhood, but you can. You can be an ambassador for one. And even if the gym membership fails, and even if you find yourself eating a piece of sugar, even if some of those other goals fall by the wayside, can, as a believer, can we just understand that if we could look back at 2023 and say, this was the year that I was a part of my neighbor knowing Jesus, or my friend knowing Jesus, or my family member knowing Jesus, or my coworker knowing Jesus, or the person in my class knowing Jesus, we could say that about the year. That's a win year. That's a win year. So we're going to guide our thoughts, our minds, and our priorities to the things that matter most. So here's what we're going to do as we finish up our time together because our time is over. Um, I want to ask for every single person in this house, if you're able and willing to, I want to ask that we're going to, the band's going to come in a second. We're going to, they're going to sing. But I want us, all of us, and I'm going to be doing it with you. I want us to come forward to the altar today. I want us to pray. Because one of these three things applies to you. There are some of you in this house, you, you, yeah, let's develop a humble heart, a heart of repentance. Others of you, yeah, there's a lot of distractions. Let's get focused on walking with God in righteousness. And others of you, yes, man, there's somebody in my story that I know needs Jesus in their story. We're going to be an agent of reconciliation and restoration. So if you will, we'll all stand. I'm going to start off our prime of prayer. And then I just want to invite you, come forward and pray. Because these things you can't do on your own. The Holy Spirit has to be involved so that we can be that person of repentance, that person of righteousness, and that person of restoration that God's called us to be. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know, you know, for my brothers and sisters, every single one, you know every single one of their needs. You know all that they're, they're walking through and all they're dealing with. And there are people on, on, in this house, there are people online that, yeah, they, they need, a heart of repentance to be rightly developed in them. And so we just pray, Jesus, that you'll help us to, to walk humbly with you and, and those around us this year. This world is so broken, Jesus, and distracting. And it's easy for us to lose our path and begin to care more about what culture thinks is valuable than walking in your will and in your way. And help us to walk in righteousness. Finally, Jesus, yeah, it's scary. It's scary to, to think we, we, we might say it wrong, we might do something wrong, and to, to be a thought that we're going to be the one that speaks to someone around us about how much you love them. It's a scary thought, and we need your Holy Spirit to remind us of the truth, that there are people that we, we are around them, and we might be the only vehicle of Christ that is in their life how selfish and broken it would be for us to have the truth, the good news, and not share it to someone that we love. Help us to be courageous to do that and confident that even our, even our broken words are better than no words at all. We love you, Lord. We believe this year is going to be a year of miracles. And we believe that as we walk in repentance, righteousness, and restoration, that you'll use us for your good work. We give this year to you and we say it in your name.